Sean, I'm going to just do a little, take advantage of, uh, of my role here as moderator to ask a quick question on metrics. Um, you know, you talk about efficiency and increases in safety. Uh, a lot of enterprise users in the audience, your potential customers, how do they capture in terms of metrics and KPIs the way, uh, how do they build that in their business model? Certainly. So, um, the big three that I, I believe um, we're always looking for as a service provider, as, a, as an educator and a trainer, uh, the, the business case can be made, again, with the safety piece, with, um, with also the quality of the information that's being uh, collected, and, and then finally, the efficiency piece. So from a, from a business perspective, we're, we're asked on a, on a regular basis in, in multiple industries to help them to understand the business case and to, uh, to help them to realize uh, the savings that they, they're hoping to see. So it, it's, not, it's not fair to obviously put a, a dollar amount on the, on the uh, safety piece of it, um, uh, but it's, we know inherently that if you can reduce unnecessary climbs, for example, uh, that you obviously will lower the risk to the individual uh, worker. And so, although the metric may never be really known, if, if we can see over time, knock on wood, uh, a reduction in the number of unnecessary climbs, then, then most likely we'll see a reduction, uh, hopefully, in, in, uh, industry, in, in uh, um, injuries that are caused from that. The second piece being quality. You have to be able to deliver the same or better quality that is, is being currently captured. And so, again, much of that quality is being captured from the climber, uh, and therefore, um, this is this is not uh, in no way am I uh, suggesting that we replace climbers. They uh, they have their place, and they I believe the last climber has not been born yet. In, in all honesty, everyone talks about uh, drones being able to do more than just uh, you know to provide pretty pictures to actually do work. I don't think we're there yet. I think we, we may be there soon, um, but the quality that is collected. Uh, allows the uh, the different companies, whether it be the turf vendor, the, the tower owner, the landowner, the builder, the networks, it allows them to make better, more informed decisions, and 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 that is obviously going to be is always going to produce um, the final piece, which is uh, efficiencies. Uh, I'll use a really basic example. I mean. Um, and many times uh, you, you are not allowed to uh, climb the structure if, uh, if you have a bird of prey or something to that effect on the tower. So is the, is the, um, does it make sense to send the team to that location or to five different locations not knowing if, if you'll be able to actually perform work that day? So here's a really, a very, if you will, easy use case for uh, UAVs to decide how to deploy your, your assets uh, and when to deploy those assets. So um, hopefully that helps you uh, to understand that I believe that the, uh, if you cannot, you can't measure what you don't, I'm sorry, you can't manage what you don't measure. And so we haven't even gotten into uh, the, um, if you will, uh, the azimuth and down tilt of the antennas and what they were designed to be uh, set up at uh, to produce you know, the, the best effective coverage. We haven't even gotten into that, but um, the safety, the quality, and then, uh, of course, finally, the efficiency piece, all of those uh, will, will definitely make the business case for the industry. I believe they have, and I think uh, the uh, demand signal is really just starting to get fired up, and that's probably a pretty good segue into, uh, uh, into art here. Okay, excellent, thank you, Sean. Uh, we, we talked about the wireless industry, uh, art, uh, we're going to go to you next. Wireless is both a user and an enabler in this tech, in, in this particular world. So uh, we're jumping around here on the list that's probably above us, uh, but we're back up to the top of the list. So Art Pregler, Director of National Mobility Systems at AT and T. Art. Yes. Yeah, so, so thank you. Yeah, we we, we got into uh, into the drone space as an extension of our push to become a, a software uh, focused network. And so we're looking at, uh, at drones as data input, data collection uh, devices, so then we can then manage, manipulate that, that data for a wide range of purposes. Um, uh, 
so the, the reasons are that we're using drones, first of all, like, like Sean said, safety is, is number one, particularly with our, our tower climbers. We have 65,000 cell sites, 15,000 tower technicians that are on our towers daily. And so that there's tremendous uh, opportunity to, to, uh, to help them uh, from, from a safety perspective. But also beyond that, we're, we're using drones to measure the performance of our network. We just, just last week, we uh, measured the performance at a University of Washington uh, stadium where we flew drones uh, throughout the, the, the stadium across all of the, the, the seating sections. We measured the, the RF performance, uplink, downlink, uh, interference capacity speed so that we would understand better under better define the user experience uh, when we when we load up that that network and so then we could make adjustments before uh, an actual game and so we're doing that with drones it used to take us uh, four weeks to map a, a stadium with, with with people walking the, the bleachers with, with with backpacks now we can do that in four hours with, with a drone so there's tremendous potential a lot of use cases opportunities uh, in, 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 in that regard. We're also looking at uh, flying cows. You may have heard of that in the press, so we're looking at potentially putting uh, antennas and uh, um, electronics on drones to provide uh, LTE signals and Wi-Fi uh, connections to uh, augment either uh, a large venue or to, uh, to, to assist uh, first responders, or if, an, if the network is down, provide coverage to people that are affected by, by a network outage. Uh, and then more recently, we're, all, we're also looking into uh, artificial intelligence on drones so that when we fly our drones, they all have video capability. Uh, we can then take advantage of, of facial recognition technologies and, and machine learning where the drone will, will know from uh, watching humans uh, how uh, we define defects or anomalies or, or uh, quality um, shortfalls in the network so that the, the drone itself can recognize these and, uh, and, and create trouble tickets so that a crew can then go out and, and, and make the, the necessary corrections. But all of this done without a human in the loop. The drone is actually making a decision. So we're looking at the, not only the drones, but the underlying technologies and ways to help our network in, in that regard. You also mentioned externally uh, um, how we're, we're supporting other industries. Um, my focus is, is internal within AT&T. We have Chris Penrose, Matt Walsh, some other folks on, on the AT&T team as well that are looking externally uh, in, in terms of, uh, of positioning our network, uh, optimizing it to, to become a backbone to support uh, traffic management of drones and, and uh, data transmission uh, uh, from drones into, the, into the, the network. So we're looking at it both internally and externally. Great. Thank you, Art. You said 15,000 technicians crawling around towers every day? Correct. Correct. Yes, and that's 15,000 across the industry, but at and is a large uh, portion of that industry. Thanks. Well, that puts it into perspective. Yeah. Very good. Okay, our, our next speaker, um, uh, Anil Anduri from Intel. Uh, Anil is the uh, VP for New Technology, uh, and he, he, has, he has participated on many different AUVSI events and, and uh, been a huge uh, a huge asset in Washington as well, helping folks at Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, understand what this opportunity is. And Neil? Thanks, Brian. Um, the aspect of uh, how Intel's playing, I mean, we believe uh, the UAV ecosystem is going to have an amazing future. Um, and these systems, um, you know, from our perspective, uh, they're just not a, 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 you know, unmanned aerial vehicle. Uh, what's most important about them is uh, the task that they're uh, chartered to do. Um, and uh, what's on board, uh, the visual intelligence and the system intelligence that are needed uh, to operate it safely. Um, and the, the most important aspect for people, uh, especially in the commercial space, as well as for a lot of consumers who see how these will get applied, it's not just about the UAV, it's about what's the data to and from the UAV which is also a very important part of that tool chain. Um, and from an Intel perspective, we work from very different areas. 
Uh, one is on the system itself. Uh, we are miniaturizing at the pace of Moore's law uh, the capabilities of uh, computing uh, that can get onto these uh, lightweight platforms uh, where payload is a very important factor because the battery technologies uh, yet to make that breakthrough. So to get more flight time, uh, you have to manage with the constraints you have uh, with the battery technology that we have. Uh, the second part of it is uh, the, the storage, the communications, uh, FPGAs, machine learning algorithms. You want to have uh, dedicated capabilities uh, on board uh, that can you know, take the system intelligence to the next level. And then you need to have an infrastructure um, and this is where the communication channels come in. Uh, Intel has a long history now in the communication areas. We build modems, we build Wi-Fi products, and uh, many communication products. And bringing that uh, to the uh, infrastructure aspect of it. Um, and then the last part is all the way to the data center and the cloud, uh, where we have a very strong portfolio of products that support that. So as part of that chain, uh, Intel has capabilities in every part of this tool set uh, which this industry will leverage and we at Intel look at how can I you know, uh, bring this in a cohesive fashion uh, to, for the industry to innovate on. Um, how do I provide the tools for uh, being able to standardize and build capabilities that can build upon uh, a very set of frameworks, uh, how you look at the PC industry evolved. Uh, it's those open standards that help that innovation move much, much more quicker, and we at Intel want to bring that. Additionally, um, we also build full commercial systems. Um, you know, we acquired Ascending Technologies, uh, so we have the uh, expertise in building full commercial grade systems uh, for the market uh, with the payloads that are useful uh, for many aspects of it, and we have the ability now to prototype uh, these uh, you know, systems uh, to make it a very, very uh, strong uh, you know, end-to-end, -end, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, pathfinding as well as proving it in the market uh, in terms of a very reliable and safe way. Um, we have a strong focus with the RealSense technology um, and trying to bring capabilities like visual sensors that are this small, eight grams, uh, or compute boards that can be ready to fly uh, for the industry uh, to be able to innovate on. Um, and then the last part is, as Intel, uh, you know, we love technology. We love to push the boundaries of technology. And in the UAV space, uh, be it bringing innovation into manned aviation, uh, flying, you know, a drone copter uh, called a volocopter, or being able to do, you know, inspections of airplanes, or you know, sell, uh, uh, or doing uh, airborne LT certification with LT uh, with AT and T that we have been working with, uh, or flying a fleet of drones. Uh, and uh, we were doing light shows in the sky. Uh, so we have a lot of innovation that we want to continue to push um, and look at how the, the world of tomorrow can be benefited by some of the technology uh, innovations we are driving today. Thank you, Anil. Uh, I think it's fair to say with your CEO, Brian Kazanich, uh, stepping on as chairman of the, the DAC, this is, must be pretty strategic for Intel. Um, why, why would why would he the, a guy as busy as Brian step up to, to do that? So I mean, our CEO is a very very passionate maker and an innovator. Uh, and that's a pilot. His, yeah, uh, he's that's his DNA. Um, and the other part of it is he's a pilot. Um, uh, he's not current uh, because he hasn't been flying uh, oh, because of the next week schedule. But uh, <laughs> and he is planning to take the remote pilot test. Uh, but. Um, um, he, he is super passionate about this industry uh, because he sees that uh, these systems uh, and the amount of data they need to handle, the amount of technology that's needed to make it robust and bring it safe into the skies, he sees this as a future uh, of where aviation is going. Um, and he is very much passionate about it. It's, it's more than uh, just work, it's a hobby and an interest. Um, and he's a great leader to, to push this innovation forward. Um, and it was an honor for us to be asked to represent uh, and be the chairman role at the DAC. And I mean, he was extremely thrilled about it and, uh, um, and bringing the industry together uh, and being able to you know, help promote this in a much larger scale. Um, I think we're, we're all looking forward to that. Excellent. Thank you, Neil. 
All right, next we're going to hear from Thomas Hahn, Vice President of Strategy and Globalization of Precision Hawk, which has been uh, very deeply involved in the, the, the Pathfinder projects, among other things, uh, which were, have been extremely important uh, and will also play a role. They've already started to give us some indications on how you get waivers, what kind of safety uh, mitigations are required in order to fly beyond what's contained in, in uh, Part 107. Thomas, not trying to steal your thunder. No, no, no problem. Thanks, Brian. And uh, thanks for inviting us to participate in this. Um, yeah, so as, as Brian mentioned, uh, Precision Hawk is in an interesting situation. We actually have the ability to fly beyond line of sight now commercially. Um, one of the waivers that Hoot was talking about earlier that was granted is um, for Precision Hawk to conduct its operations that we have been doing within visual line of sight actually beyond visual line of sight. And what's interesting about that from a technology perspective is we start to talk about mobility and connectivity. Um, I think most folks in the room know uh, most of these drones are operated via radio frequency, which when you start to get outside of line of sight can be a potential issue. And so we've actually been working with many partners, AT&T being one of them, um, to start to think about how you can use LTE connectivity to be the backbone, uh, that technology component that allows beyond line of sight flight. And so there's a lot still yet to come. Um, a lot of research being done uh, directly with the FAA and their participation is fantastic. Uh, their guidance on where operations should be conducted, how they should be conducted um, is of utmost importance and they've been a great partner. And so uh, with that, I'll, I'll leave it. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Um, it, it's, I know that you guys have been doing work in the agriculture, uh, in the agricultural area. Um, can, can you relate it a little bit to how it's, how it's specific to this audience yeah, as well? Yeah, so um, most of our operations are remote sensing operations. So you're actually going to learn something that you didn't know before about your asset base. Uh, oftentimes that happens in agriculture today, uh, very remote areas. Uh, but that similar technology stack on the remote sensing side can be applied uh, when you're thinking about network development from a mobility perspective. Uh, or network planning, um, but also even just down to basic inspection and, ma and maintenance. Um, oftentimes we talk about the agriculture use case because there's a lot of land that needs to be inspected regularly, um, but that can also be very easily moved over into uh, folks like AT&T managing their own network that way. That remote sensing use case um, is pretty vertical agnostic and uh, the ability to do that beyond line of sight we think is probably the most critical thing because it obviously increases efficiency in operations, but it really gives you a better perspective on your asset base that you didn't have before. Because frankly, getting out to a lot of these places uh, can be quite a challenge uh, to get humans there. So uh, getting a drone there is a lot easier. Okay, thank you, Thomas. And then fifth in the batting order is Christopher <laughs> Mochia. Christopher, I think I've heard the word measure used at least three times already. Oh, yeah. uh, so that's a great setup for you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everybody, for uh, attending. Um, <clears throat> as Brian mentioned, I'm with Measure, and uh, we serve a lot of industry verticals, including agriculture, as Thomas was just saying. Um, we've actually worked with uh, Precision Hawk quite extensively in the past. Um, ag agriculture is, is very important to Measure. Uh, we also have recently, uh, uh, since, since roughly January, when I got on the team, uh, been actively involved in, in the wireless space, both from an inspection perspective as well as audits. Um, and we're bringing a uh, kind of a unique flavor to everything. Everything we do is safe, legal, and insured. We hire the best pilots. Most of them are ex-military uh, with a lot of flight time, not only in manned operations, but also UAS. So we, we really see a lot of synergies with the wireless industry in general, as, as, as if I can kind of piggyback on what, uh, what Sean and, and Art were saying relative to the network. Um, 
we think it's, it's, it's certainly a lot safer. Uh, we think it's more efficient. We can get faster data and uh, get, get objective data, which can be used for change management down the road. And, and, and we, we typically get uh, two centimeters in terms of resolution. Um, <clears throat> but as, as things evolve, uh, we're going to need the wireless networks to support other things that we do, like drone delivery and beyond visual line of sight, as, as, as Thomas was saying, as well as Anil. It's, it's going to be critical that we have the networks in the position where you know, the right tilts are there, that we, we can conduct bulletproof operations without having to, to worry about other types of uh, comps, for lack of a better word. So when that, when that happens, there's going to be a lot of new doors that open for all, everybody in the industry. It's going to be phenomenal. We'll get new revenue streams for data and for uh, uh, just, uh, just, a, just a variety of different uh, uh, opportunities and things that we can't even conceive of today. So it's a, it's a very exciting time, and uh, we're very, very excited to participate in not only the technology and, and the stuff we can do now, like, like the audits, inspections, environmental checks, disaster reconnaissance. Um, it's just, <clears throat> and, and, and frankly, with night operations, that's going to be uh, extremely important from a wireless standpoint, too. Uh, just last week, you know, with the hurricane, to have this technology available under 107 would have been, you know, just outstanding. Uh, but due to certain TFRs, and as Hoot mentioned, we're not fully there yet with implementation of, of, of all the rules. But uh, we see this as a great vehicle to, to go in, to, to look at ingress, egress, identify what's damaged on the network, what's flown away, so the crews can bring the right, right equipment and, and reattach it and get, these, get the critical network up and running for life-saving operations. So there's just, we could talk about this for hours and hours and hours, but it's, uh, it's a very exciting time. We, uh, we also want to reinforce that uh, we don't really view this as, as taking away jobs uh, with general contractors. We view this as, as just adding to the safety and uh, coming up with uh, uh, better and more efficient ways to uh, uh, get, get fundamental and actionable data. So, thank you, Brian. Christopher, the, uh, Art gave us the, the number of 15,000, and that's across the industry. That's just wireless alone, Correct. right? You've got yeah. infrastructure. That's a big that word. That's yeah. Know, that that's doesn't a include the stuff. yeah. That doesn't include people that do bridge inspection okay. or other type of wind inspection, mills. wind wind turbines, right. uh, you know, the, the transmission towers uh, for utilities, um, which. You know, it's, it's, it's very, very, very dangerous. Um, and it's dangerous for manned operations too, whether it be helicopter or, or a, a fixed wing. So, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna be in the position to really save a lot of lives and do so it much it, more effectively. My question to you is at some point, we're gonna run out of pilots coming out of the military that who gives and trained. Correct. <laughs> and, 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 and we're gonna, you know, they're obviously, Folks that are that are stepping up, they're taking the exam. Um, how are we doing the training for? I, I mean, I, I have my UAS certificate now, and I'm really excited about that. But frankly, my son, who used to chase the cat around with, you know, a toy helicopter, has right. probably got better stick and rudder skills than I do. Um, how do we go to the next level? Yes, we don't. We, we will train people for the FAA exam on where not to fly, but people in the wireless industry I want to know that they have a standard, that the people that are flying around their equipment are well trained to do that. What, give me your sense of, of at what point you know, the industry itself has got to get better organized around that subject. Great question, Brian. Um, I'm also a part of the, uh, the NATE UAS committee, and one of the things, and, and the NATE group is the National Association of Tower Erectors. 
which are principally involved with with the 15,000 folks that, um, that, that Art was referring to. Um, we're in the process of drafting some, some fundamental training type information, specifically addressing wireless uh, infrastructure, because it, it does require more uh, uh, technical expertise and understanding of RF energy and how that can impact various types of systems. So we want to come up with a standard template of, you know, separation between, you know, different types of uh, energy sources such as antennas, microwaves, uh, working around sensitive structures like guide towers, having the proficiency and the ability to, to safely perform those operations without impacting the, the network or the the asset owner or the tower company or, or whoever. Um, so all of this is, uh, is extremely critical. From a measure standpoint, we, we value the, the safety culture of, of the tr traditional FAA Airman certificate because it's very safety driven and it's a cultural thing that stays in your head. So from our standpoint, we're not necessarily looking for the, the the kid that's really good at Grand Theft Auto to, to do the joysticks on the, on the UAS. But, you know, we, we because the, the engineered type of scopes that we provide that require a lot of precision and, and it's a very uh, potentially dangerous environment, we want to make sure that we, we, we keep that safety culture in place and, and translate that into our, our teams. Um, the, the part 107 does not require a visual observer. But around some infrastructure, we're still gonna, we're still gonna have a VO because it's just too, too difficult for, for, from a depth perception perspective uh, for our pilots to, to see, let's say, a tower at 1,500 feet above the ground, which we can legally fly uh, <clears throat> to, to spot that aircraft around big guide towers. You know, it's just not rational and reasonable and we view it as a safety risk. So from our standpoint, you know, there, we're, we're, we're gonna be very cognizant and, and, and make sure that our training protocols exceed what is, what is typically uh, uh, mandated by the FARs. Or did you want to, I mean, as, a, as, a, as an AT&T person that is concerned about network reliability and things like that, you know, how, some of this will probably be make, some of it will probably be buy, but what kind of training do you see as necessary going in before? That must be part of the discussion inside of your organization as well. Sure. You're, you're training above and beyond what FAA re re requires? Yeah. Certainly, yeah. So um, we, we require, well, when we vet um, service providers that provide services, drone services for us, we we ensure that, that they have a, a knowledge of wireless infrastructure, so they know what they're looking what they're looking at, what they're flying around, particularly guide towers with the guy wires. So that, that, that's uh, could be a challenge for for pilots up at, at higher altitudes, even though we're, they're within visual line of sight, even though they're within 400 feet of the tower. It's still a challenging environment. So, yeah, the, 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 there's a lot of. Uh, I guess special qualifications that we would look at for anyone flying in and around uh, towers, not you know getting caught up with with not only the guy wires but the, the, the cabling, the, the connectors, the, uh, flying in front of an, an emitting you know an antenna, the, the, a lot of RF energy there. There's a lot of a uh, lot, lot of things to consider in that environment. And Neil, I know you guys have got a great technology that keeps things a, a drone from bump, bumping into things. Yeah. Maybe. How does that figure into this conversation? Yeah, so we're taking a technology approach. Uh, I know how many of you have flown uh, uh, you know, UAV or even a remote helicopter, a toy helicopter. Uh, the, the ability for a pilot to know the distance, um, especially when he's looking straight ahead, um, it's very difficult to know how close he is to an object. Even at 30 feet, it starts to become a problem. Um, am I one feet away or am I two feet close? Um, and so when you are inspecting like towers and aspects of it, 
Um, you know, uh, yes, under part 107, visual line of sight, uh, the pilot is killed, uh, but you know, most of the incidents that happen in flying these are human errors. Um, and so how do we give pilot assist capabilities from collision avoidance, for example? Uh, how can the drone itself know, okay, stay close to the tower, but stay away from it by a few meters? No, don't go closer than that. Uh, how do you give him that ability to say, you know what, I can fly it, and I know the system has the capability to know how close it is, um, and that's where we have like sensors like RealSense technology, uh, where we are building, uh, miniaturizing them so you can put them in a 360 degree mode, and to be able to navigate through these uh, challenges that uh, you know the people in the industry will have uh, getting close, and that's exactly what we demonstrated uh, with uh, Airbus at Farmbro um, in Europe, uh, where we inspected a Airbus A380 uh, with the drone uh, with the RealSense cameras, and uh, which had the anti-collision feature, so they could fly as close as like three meters from the airplane, three to four meters from the airplane, and go fully automated goes around the airplane, takes all the pictures, and then reconstructs it for an inspection. Um, and so there are definitely, you know, uh, again, these are, by the way, technologies over time uh, will help make these systems fly around people, fly around, you know, uh, beyond line of sight. But even under the purview of 107 today, um, I see a lot of features that can bring uh, pilot assist so again, uh, operator assist. So when you are trying to look for an object and fly at the same time, um, how can I make it safer? Um, and so th that's something at Intel we are constantly looking at and building the next versions of these technologies uh, and continuing to push that envelope uh, for bringing onboard safety. Go ahead, Sean, I know you want to ask this. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'd like to jump in. Uh, technology or the improvements in technology are, are why we can even have these discussions it wasn't too long ago that the safety and the control uh, and the reliability of these smaller vehicles really didn't, didn't give us the confidence to perform these acts. Um, now that we have that, we cannot forget uh, the training piece of it. So uh, while I will applaud the FAA all day, I've been dealing with the FAA in, ma in the man side for more than 25 years, um, and I honestly didn't believe the 107 rules were going to come out as quickly as they did. And I honestly be I believe they were going to be a lot more restrictive. But um, again, they did a great job of getting the rules on, on the street with a, using a, a risk-based approach, allowing for consumers, I'm sorry, for uh, those of us who are going to perform the, uh, the commercial operations to get to work uh, using that risk-based approach. However. As, as, the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, as the father of a 16-year-old, um, and I know that that's the uh, minimum age, um, I know the decisions that my son makes every day, and, and they aren't necessarily mature enough to, to uh, operate without those, um, if you will, um, technology backups. And so in manned aviation, you spend 95% of your time acting as if the technology is not working for you and, and still being able to take off and land the most, the most if you will, challenging portion of it uh, unassisted. So while what Anil is mentioning is extremely important to allow us to, to, to perform new, uh, new use cases in, in challenging environments, we, we should not overlook, which I think is, is if you will, um, the biggest risk, the amount of time we should spend training uh, to, pre to prepare ourselves and to prepare the operators, whether they be organic to the organization or third, you know, uh, commercial third-party operators, uh, to ensure that um, if technology is not there, that they can still make the right decisions. And, and this goes with manned aviation or unmanned aviation. I think we'll all agree that the best decisions are made right here. We call it at zero, zero altitude and zero airspeed. So the decision as an example of whether or not to fly at all that day. So even though technology may allow it, the, the UAV can handle those winds. Um, it's, it's important for us to get this job done. It's going to be an efficient way to uh, perform the work. The decision, there's a, there's a decision that has to be made of whether or not it's worth the risk. From, from a monetary perspective, 
So, so many of these vehicles are ranging from 50, 80 to 100 plus thousand dollars. So the risk reward, does it make sense for us to do this one last flight on these and these uh, challenging conditions at the risk? How, how many more jobs do we have to do to make up in case we, you know, we, we cause an issue or have, have an incident? And never forget, uh, you know, every time technology hands us something uh, that makes life better, it also hands us a risk with that. So for example, the cell phone. Texting and driving was not a thing before cell phones. Um, so there are inherent dangers. And we're now lifting 25 up to 55 pound vehicles uh, up into the air. And you know, I'm, I'm a poli-sci major, so I won't try and do any, any public math, but 55 pounds dropping, not, it doesn't have to drop very far for it to actually cause some damage. So the training piece, uh, and that's where the, the larger organizations are gonna demand um, not only good training programs, but past performance, as well as the insurance industry. The insurance industry is, has and will continue to, to affect and to, uh, if you will, apply um, more restrictions to, to, prov to keep us uh, and to keep uh, people like my, my son, my 16 year old son who thinks it's okay to you know, ride without a helmet or you know, uh, doesn't need to wear a seat belt while he's driving a Jeep because he's not on road, he's, he's doing <laughs> off road. So anyways, um, the industry and, and the requirements that the industry will put on the operators before they're allowed to do work will probably be much more stringent. Uh, and that I believe is, is a good thing because um, right now with the 107 out, um, I'm, I'm kind of holding my breath because legally, uh, a lot of people will be a, be allowed to fly, um, and so just like texting and driving, it's going to happen. I just I just hope that uh, it doesn't happen, uh, and people don't get hurt as a as a result of it. Thomas, I'm going to give you a crack here on the training question before I turn it over and ask for a question um, from the audience. Mostly, uh, you know, I I agree with a lot that's been said. Uh, the one thing I'll point out. Um, is I think there is this blend between the technology enablement um, and as the use cases get more and more sophisticated and the operations get more and more challenging, I think it's actually on a lot of folks at this conference to help provide solutions um, from a technology perspective because we do need to have trained operators and folks who understand specifically what they're looking for um, it, because the only reason why we're getting in the air in the first place is for some type of result. And so um, having that trained operator is key, but having those technology enablers really work seamlessly with them is incredibly important. Um, AT&T's efforts around mapping connectivity at altitude is critical because we need to understand if you are going to be flying beyond line of sight, how am I going to continue to stay connected with that vehicle? Um, and without those types of enablers, we can have the most trained operator there is, but if the technology truly just fails and lets us down, you know, that's when we have these risky scenarios. And so I think it's really that blend of, the, of what we have seen happen in the consumer space um, for consumer electronics. We really need to see a lot of that get, get moved over into drones and frankly quickly uh, because the value of doing those types of more complex operations is tremendously more than doing the very, very simple, basic operations. Great, thank you. All right, so I could run out the clock here with questions for this great panel, but uh, that kind of defeats the purpose of giving you guys the information and the actionable tools you need. So Jessica has got the mic. See a show of hands. Okay, don't be shy, who has a question? There's been a lot of information that's just come out to everybody, and I know you're all processing it, but we do have a little bit of time, and this is kind of a, a huge opportunity that you're being presented with, so there you go. My, my question is uh, from the gentleman, for the gentleman from, uh, from uh, Precision Hawk. Um, so you recently got a waiver um, to fly drones beyond the line of sight, and it's, uh, it's a quite a big achievement, actually, in the drone community. And a lot of startups actually vying to get that waiver. Absolutely. Without disclosing any trade secrets, um, what, what would like maybe the two or three things that uh, that FAA found compelling enough to, so as to give you guys that, that waiver? Sure. So um, 
as I had mentioned before, um, Precision Oc has been doing a tremendous amount of research directly with the FAA for more than a year now um, on these types of more complex operations like flying beyond line of sight. Um, we had actually been granted under the previous schema the ability to do that as well uh, for research purposes and testing purposes. And what we've learned is that there's some operational conditions under which um, actually very similar to the operational operational conditions that 107 kind of carves out, which is obviously not flying over other people, making sure that you're in kind of uncongested airspace, uh, staying at lower altitudes, where you can actually demonstrate concepts of operations, especially for remote sensing, like we were talking about, uh, where the risk level is very, very low. Um, and so we use, frankly, a blend of operational training, um, uh, we have a lot of really, really capable operators um, who have the experience under our research of flying beyond line of sight, uh, as well as technology. And so this is where um, I, I talked a little bit before about LTE connectivity and those types of things. By being able to track and know where your drone is in relation to lots of other things, uh, whether that be other manned aircraft, whether that be obstacles on the ground um, is critical uh, because by definition, you as the operator are not in that situation um, or in that environment. And so it's really a blend of those things. Um, we use a, a piece of technology we call Lattice um, that really uh, piggybacks on cellular networks like AT&T um, and is able to maintain communication with the drone kind of systemically. Um, now, obviously, uh, we do that in areas where we know there is connectivity, uh, because you don't want to risk uh, losing that connectivity. Um, but uh, there are efforts underway, uh, AT&T is leading, on really understanding what that connectivity is across the continental United States. And then once that is established, I think you'll see very straightforward ways uh, for you to be able to operate beyond line of sight. Hello, everybody. I'm not sure uh, which is the best person so you can make the decision, but uh, we know that Amazon is looking at this pretty soon. Domino's Pizza is going to look at this, <laughs> on and on and on. And so uh, you have a situation where, unless they're all coordinated, you're going to have uh, 100 drones in a couple of square blocks. Uh, is there a path towards reconciling uh, the popularity of this drone? And, and burritos. Don't forget burritos. Uh, just, beer. just announced yesterday or the, uh, today, I, I think, that burritos are going to be delivered on the uh, Virginia Tech campus. Uh, so, you know, thank you, Google. Uh, I'm not sure who the partner is that's actually producing the burritos. Um, does somebody want to talk about UTM? Yeah, uh, I. Or, you know, or, okay, so uh, as you know, with, uh, there's a universal traffic management. Uh, it's a cross uh, industry effort along with the government. Uh, NASA has been, uh, NASA Ames has been driving this. Um, and so the idea there is to actually find a homogeneous way to have uh, air traffic management for UAS. Uh, as you know, the manned traffic system, which is air traffic control um, and using ADSB. Um, and uh, they work at higher altitudes. Uh, it's, it's actually, you know, there are 330,000 registered airplanes in the United States, and we already have over 500,000 UAV pilots registered who each of them could have multiple drones. Um, and so you are quickly going to overwhelm the amount of traffic coming from unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, and so you need to rethink at a systemic level uh, the kind of infrastructure needed to manage this. Um, and uh, the, the traditional infrastructure cannot handle it. Uh, but at any point in time, how can they do this in a safe, cohesive manner? Uh, and what's rule number one? Rule number one is keep drones away from airplanes. I mean, that's rule number one. Um, and if you can do that uh, effectively uh, through a good interdependency of uh, the, uh, the different protocols in the national airspace, um, it can be achieved. Um, and uh, I think that's what UTM's charter to do. 
Uh, they're doing a lot of tests in different locations. Uh, and I think that infrastructure as a system, um, as a framework, uh, will probably be the baseline of how uh, UAS traffic management uh, can be deployed. Now, the, the actual technology going into each of it could be different kind of APIs and different kind of capabilities, uh, but the system will be designed to work cohesively. Hi, uh, this question could be answered by anybody. Uh, so, the question is, um, with respect to the LTE connectivity, uh, so, I mean, the, is a plan, I mean, uh, are we going to have a dedicated infrastructure for servicing drones, or the current terrestrial infrastructure could itself be utilized for uh, connectivity for drones? Because, uh, I mean, at getting a service at, let's say 300, 400 feet, is it possible that the existing uh, infrastructures could itself be used without much change? Or how, are, how confident are we that the connectivity could be provided at that uh, kind of attitude so as to have this kind of a safety levels which we are you know, kind of talking about today? That, that would be the first question. The last question is uh, uh, regarding the spectrum aspects, uh, I mean, do we foresee a, a, a separate spectrum, dedicated spectrum for uh, command control? Or it could be that a licensed spectrum such as LT, you know, could be itself be used for uh, you know C2 purposes. So, what are your uh, thoughts on those things? Thank you. Okay. I, I can take. Yeah. I can take part of that. Um, well, at least I heard the part of asking if we're going to make adjustments or need to make adjustments to the network. We are definitely need to need to make adjustments to the network. It is at least our AT&T network. All of the carriers uh, potentially have the their networks optimized for ground-based uh, connections. And so if we're talking about drones flying at altitude, well, that, that, that is a scenario that wasn't uh, in the original design. So, so we are going to need to make adjustments to, to, to the network, potentially capital improvements, uh, software upgrades to, uh, to, to accommodate that, that drone traffic at the various altitudes going up. Uh, And, uh, you had a question on spectrum. Uh, yeah, as, as far as we know, there is spectrum reserved by the government, but that's more for larger uh, traffic. Uh, I think the C-band spectrum uh, infrastructure doesn't exist, but clearly this is uh, uh, something that at least I've heard at the OSTP event uh, in, the, at, in Washington that we had, uh, led by the White House Science and Technology, um, that um, this is a big uh, next step as to, you know, um, how we go, uh, to whether we need dedicated spectrum, piggyback on existing infrastructure. I think, uh, personally, if I look at it in the future, you will see it in a staged approach, uh, that a lot of these pieces will work uh, uh, because you have infrastructure, you want to take advantage of it. Uh, and where you don't have it, then you probably want to create something new, then you can cr have the better opportunity to create it in a, in a, in a spectrum where you could have some dedicated, uh, whether it's licensed or you know, unlicensed in that aspect. So I think this will be a stage approach, uh, but uh, you know, uh, this is a very, very important part of uh, this puzzle of uh, bringing UAVs to mass adoption. Um, I think uh, that's what will unlock it. Um, and I think it's, uh, that's why we, we are very extremely happy to see the industry come to it, uh, from AT&T to all the way from people who are building it to building the technology, how we can kind of homogenize this in a, in a safe manner. Uh, Brian, if you want to add something from AUESI. Um, I, I don't. Okay. <laughs> I don't. I, I know better than to talk about spectrum in a place like yes. this. Which is full of experts on spectrum. So. Yeah, the the one Thank thing you. I'll add uh, on the question, uh, you heard Hoot earlier uh, talk about some industry standards and kind of performance-based industry standards. I think what you'll see, and this is kind of linking Anil's comment, um, is you'll see that staged approach based on the use case, and then. Obviously, the more advanced use cases will just need a much higher performance standard. Um, and the great thing is, with efforts like UTM, there really are collections of the industry really coming together to say, yeah, this, we need to hit this level of 
latency as a simple example, because uh, without that, you know, th there's risk in the system. So you'll see things like that. I don't think I think it may potentially be technology agnostic, um, uh, but there will just be requirements kind of set out by the community. One thing that I will add is uh, we're, AUVSI, I mentioned the numbers at the top of, of uh, the hour when we were talking about the, the economic impact. One of the things that we're doing now is looking at what would be the economic impact of that system where we had UTM build, what's five? Is yeah. the, you know, like the, the highest level. Yeah. Uh, what would be the impact? I mean, we have an astonishing number of packages delivered in this country today that are under five pounds. It, it's, it's, it's a number that even I didn't credit. Um, and, and, and so there's a, if I've learned anything about technology and the way it works its way into the marketplace, always watch the logistics guys, you know, because because they they move, they, they make the world run, you know, they, they, they make the world actually go. We can't back up from the things that we do uh, when, when we have an incremental improvement, let alone a step function of logistics. So what we've done is we're, we're in the process of getting ready to publish numbers that, that indicate what is the economic impact of the end game for this. When we have the ability to fly literally autonomously uh, with the system basically managing itself. Many of those pieces are, are already uh, there. They need to be integrated better. Many gaps exist. Um, and, and, and the reason why we're doing that, not unlike when we did the first forecast, is to build the business case for investing in this. There's already large investment. You know, we, we're talking about you know massive numbers that need to be invested for 5G, for example, uh, in, in this in this community. Uh, this is a potential way to amortize that kind of an investment. But we have to capture that that business case. We have to look at what that economic impact is. So whether you know how fast we get there. Uh, and exactly what the technology solutions are that will be adopted to get from here to there uh, is, is a great debate right now. And we've got lots of really great ideas coming together, uh, largely under, under NASA's uh, purview. But the long and the short is that I am absolutely persuaded we are going to get there uh, because of the economic pull uh, that naturally occurs uh, in, in, in this system. So. Gentlemen, this will be our last. Oh, I'm sorry. Brian. Go ahead, Jessica. I see, we have time for one more question if we squeeze it in. Okay. So I'm going to put uh, Intel on the spot because I was over at the inner drone, and you you were just talking about keeping the uh, drones away from traditional air traffic, essentially. Uh, but in your booth, you had a really cool video of a test pilot riding under this oversized drone. Uh, you know, I mean, at the rate changer, things are changing. You know, I'm not ready to jump in one now, but at the same time, an autonomous car versus an autonomous aerial vehicle, what's the difference? Um, actually, um, so the gentleman here is referring to a volocopter. Uh, it's a 400, uh, it can carry two people, um, and it has 18 rotors. Uh, it's fully redundant system, um, and you can fly it with a joystick. Um, that's how easy it is to fly. Uh, and if you are a helicopter pilot, uh, you can just let go of your joystick in the air and it'll hover uh, and stay there. Um, and so th that's what the, the ease of flying happens, but to get that to a real world application, um, you know, the biggest challenge and I can be, you know, is the flight time um, and the battery uh, electric power technology uh, uh, and the batteries uh, technology that you need to carry for that thrust, um, it's not there yet. And then so I think the question then comes down to is, um, uh, when, when can we see something like this? Uh, but what's amazing is that the technology um, can be applied. Now you could make a hybrid design, this is both of, you know, kind of one of those uh, uh, plug-in kind of uh, hybrids where you have gas and, you know, electric. So you clearly have mechanics in which uh, how such a solution can come and, and actually uh, create manned aviation vehicles. Uh, uh, technically could also be unmanned for carrying cargo um, and uh, you know, or in terms of emergency response, emergency response uh, you want to drop uh, equipment up uh, you know, after a hurricane and things like that. So there's clearly a lot of areas where you could put, uh, you know, um, where human safety is at risk, you could use these. 
Um, and, and you'll see that evolve. Uh, but these are systems, when they get bigger, you really want to take the, you know, uh, the approach that Mandy Aviation has taken, uh, type certification processes, uh, the training processes. You want to be able to you know, build that as part of the systemic approach of safety. Um, and make sure that these are reliable and robust. So this, it's good to see the innovation. Uh, I, I can foresee a future where you could have your own personal carrying vehicle, um, uh, but I think uh, it's a little way out there, but I don't see it, and I wouldn't say it's impossible, it's, it's just a question of time, um, but do it in a safe manner. Okay, um, we're, we're coming to the end here, and Jessica's got a beautiful smile, but a really long hook, so. Uh, we're going to leave it there. Uh, please join me in a round of applause for this terrific panel.